I'm very excited that we have a special guest with us today, um, Ms. Diana Mara Henry. Um, she was the official, one of the official photographers for the National Women's Conference in 1927. And she also photo documented the New York State meeting. She's had a very long, illustrative career as a photojournalist. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled that she's joining us today. And I'm going to engage with her in conversation for about 30 minutes. So we can learn more about her and um, the incredible work that she's done. So um, Diana, I'm just going to begin by asking you um, how you became interested in photojournalism. Uh, well, um, so I was I was a government major at, at Harvard, uh, which at the time it was there was a woman's school that had started when women couldn't go to Harvard, but still wanted to learn with the Harvard professors. So an institution was created called Radcliffe. And uh, <clears throat> Radcliffe eventually merged with Harvard. So now women are admitted to Harvard. But in 1965, when I went into Radcliffe, we got Harvard degrees, but we lived separately, but went to all the classes together. Um, so, uh, I, I, now I say Harvard because <laughs> no one knows Radcliffe anymore. Um, I was a government major. I minored in history and I actually won the Ferguson History Prize for the best sophomore essay in history. That was when I was a history major before I <laughs> changed to government. And by senior year, I wanted to be a a visual studies major, but they told me, no, no, that's enough. <laughs> so I was a government major. Uh, history was definitely not her story at, in those times. In fact, uh, my first click uh, feminist moment was in a class in anthropology when the professor was uh, talking about Ruth Benedict great anthropologist and it still hurts me today to say this but he he commented only on her uh, problems with her menstrual cycle and reduced her work to being a result of those physical ailments so i remember my roommate at radcliffe and i just looking at each other and uh, you know, talking about it afterwards. The other feminist moment that I had about Harvard <laughs> came uh, at our 25th reunion when we started to talk about whether we had had women teachers. And I realized that during my four years there, I had never had a single woman teacher, not a, not a, um, not even a teaching assistant in one of the sections. Uh, and this was a shared experience among a lot of people in our class, men and women had not had a single female professor. So anyway, there you go. Um, so, but the other thing that I did more than anything else, I was one of the few people in my graduating class of 69, that's 1969, who, um, <clears throat> who graduated without honors. <laughs> so the graduation booklet that I have is like pages and pages of summas and magnas and cums. And then there's like <laughs> 10 names, <laughs> no honors. So there are a lot of adventures that were a lot of fun. But what I was doing was I was learning photography. And I learned photography uh, at the Harvard Crimson. And, um, you know, and they're, you know, not only learning the darkroom skills and photographing on assignment, whatever I had to do that day, whether it was a news event or sports or a portrait, um, it, was, it was a great education, but also the uh, other photographers there were very, uh, very good photographers and uh, and then we'd sit around until all hours of the night you know how it is those of you who are students and or were students which we all were and 
looking through photography books and talking about each photograph. And what I realized later also, not at the time, was that we weren't looking at the work of women photographers, which was pretty much unknown. So the, the books of history of photography at the time also included very few women photographers. So after graduation, I, I moved on to NBC News where I was a, a researcher for a program called From Here to the 70s. And so I got to know a little bit about NBC News and there was another uh, classmate of mine who was also working at NBC. And we used to meet in the ladies room as it was called at the time, uh, at lunch. And actually I remember us crying because we both wanted to uh, advance at NBC. I mean, we knew we were in beginning positions, but from what we saw at the time in 69, the only women who were advancing at the network were women who went to Vietnam, you know, took very uh, dangerous jobs, uh, such as Gloria Emerson, who, who became very famous, or who slept with people. And in fact, I heard a very interesting discussion later, much later, uh, years later, with the first group of anchor women who, uh, who had come up. And, and into prominence in, in, in the networks. And they all started their careers in 72. So it was, you know, it was not much later, but, you know, it made all the difference. So anyway, after that was, a, that was only supposed to be, you know, a short term assignment for the time of preparing that documentary. And then I was looking for work and um, I had done some writing at, at the Crimson just because I thought, well, you know, it would probably be useful to have as a portfolio piece. And so I did some features and some news articles. And so I met someone at, the, at an employment agency who took an interest in me while we were sitting there. And she said, what, you know, what are you looking for? And, you know, I told her, oh, I don't know, maybe a secretarial job or something. And she said, well, why don't you, she said, well, what have you done? Or, you know, what, what's your education? And I told her, and she said, why don't you go work? My husband works for the Staten Island Advance. Why don't you go work there? And I'm just telling you this because, you know, for people who are just starting out or, or maybe haven't, you know, uh, found a course yet, um, I think every encounter in life can be really significant. You know, and you don't know who, you might be just sitting in a waiting room somewhere and someone will tell you something that can change your life. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, I wouldn't disregard that, I wouldn't disregard, you know, anyone. So, um, so I went out to the Staten Island Advance and I showed them three clippings that I, you know, that I'd done at the Crimson, you know, and, um, I got a call when I got back from the managing editor who I talked to, and he said, well, we'd like to hire you for $100 a week. And I was so stunned that I just stood there with her. You used to hold your phone in your hand, sort of like you hold the cell phone today, but uh, <laughs> it was connected with the cord. I just held the phone and he said, uh, so there was a silence and he said to me, well, we could make that 110 a week. So I guess he, he thought I was bargaining with him. So it was like, gee, I got a job and a raise, you know, just by shutting up, which is probably what I should do now. But anyway, um, so I was a reporter and I did features, including one uh, feature that actually they morphed into three Sunday features above the masthead uh, about a, a, a special, um, you know, a, a, basically a U.S. interrogator in uh, Vietnam who had become one of the leaders of Vietnam veterans against the war. And he, he became a very important person in my life. I photographed his wedding later on, his 
political campaigns. And, um, uh, and that led to a whole 10 years of, of photography of Vietnam veterans against the war, which is not what we're here to discuss. But, uh, and then, but I couldn't photograph because the photographers, I brought my camera one day and the photographer who I'd never met came out of the newsroom, walked straight to my desk, looked at my camera and said, do you want that broken? And I had already heard from the night editor, who was the son of Wilhelm Reich, Peter Reich, that photographers were very opposed to that newspaper to, you know, anyone encroaching on their territory. So I put the camera in my drawer and never brought it again. But I decided after I had had, I went to, I asked the managing editor if I could go photograph the rally in DC. There was a big anti-war rally in DC. And he said, you can go, but he said, we'll publish it under a pseudonym. We don't want our reporters associated with, you know, a rally in Washington. So that and another experience, which was very poignant that we don't have time for, I just said, you know, if I want to be a photographer, first of all, I can't be here. So I went to work for Al Gore Sr. And then when I came back, I, I just decided I, you know, I'd dive into photography. So, um, thank you. So what? Did yeah. You, thank you so much, Diana. Yeah. Uh, such really rich history and lived experience. Um, I really appreciate you sharing those lessons with us and insights. I, I want to transition to the question, which I think you're already anticipating, which is, yeah. how did you become interested in documenting women's history? Um, so, um, so I was going to tie that in with um, one of the feature articles that I wrote at the Staten Island Advance was about the Alice Austin House. And um, that got me very interested in Alice Austin, who some of you may know, because recently, this is a wonderful book about her work. <clears throat> anyway, recently, um, you know, there's been some interest in her personal life, which, um, but for me, it was her photography. I realized that no one had done a book about the great women photographers who had come to admire. And uh, so that was, that was something that later on I worked on restoring her house, saving her house, restoring her house and making it into a museum. So, um, which is one of the things that I'm proudest of doing. So, uh, but then I heard Bella Abzo. <laughs> I was printing at night in my dark room. I would listen to Pacifica radio station, a Pacifica network radio station, which was WBAI in New York. And wasn't paying much attention. All of a sudden I heard this woman's voice, brash and, you know, Leander knows a lot about Bella, obviously. I never heard a woman speak like that. You know, my mother was a very powerful woman, but extremely reserved and silent. And uh, Bella was, was so brash, so outspoken, so vibrant. And I thought, I have to, I have to go see this woman and photograph her. And I went down to a press conference the next day at the Battery and um, I dropped my camera. I squirmed through the photographers, the 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 mail, uh, TV people, and photographers surrounding her, and sort of squirmed through their legs, and and sort of knelt at her feet, looking up. And it's you know it it, it was um, it was a great moment for me and also for her because I became her campaign photographer. And uh, and those photographs I gave her for free and they were used in posters. But after that, she always paid me. And, um, and then that same year, 72, I was given my first paid assignment, which was to photograph Liz Holtzman for her congressional campaign, actually for her primary campaign and then for her congressional campaign. And, um, 
so in 76, I became uh, aware of the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe, now Harvard. And um, this great, you know, archive of women's history. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I propose my photography to them since, you know, and I'll tell them I specialize in photographing women. So really until that time I hadn't, you know, I hadn't sort of pigeonholed myself, but I had a professor in college who said, you know, you should pick an area that no one else <laughs> is doing and become a specialist in that. His specialist was colonial gravestones. And so he said, you know, you will soon be recognized as the world, world's expert on this subject. Well, I didn't pick a very small subject because women, as we know, are, you know, more than half of history. But I presented my work to the Schlesinger and they took it on extended loan. They said, we don't know what the relationship's going to be with Harvard you know, you may want to just deposit the photographs on loan. So they took 500 of my photographs into their collection. And, um, you know, they, they later, you know, bought it. Uh, but um, so that was, that was really the beginning of my sort of presenting myself in this way. Although, you know, my work as you know, is very diverse, but, that's, you know, that was the first time that it sort of, you know, clicked into focus for me. And then after that, uh, you know, all of the realizations about what was, what was happening with women, how active, you know, women were, were being and how much, um, how much I could actually have an influence on how this was recorded so that never again would women be left out of history because I would have photographed these events. And, and so later on, I put a lot of attention into preserving my photographs, you know, archiving them, moving them around the country dozens of times. And, um, you know, and finally seeing them into collections, which is, you know, a lot of people do great photography and don't organize it and can't access it and eventually it's lost and all the great people they photographed. Thank you, Diana. I think yeah. as historians and budding historians, I think really appreciate your, your careful attention to the historical archive. Um, I wanted to ask you how you became the one of the official photographers for the National Women's Conference. So this and came as you. Of, yeah. I was going to also ask as you approached yeah. that assignment, what is it that you absolutely wanted to capture? Like, how did you approach that assignment? Well, um, you know, I'd been Bella's photographer, and she was named to be the um, presiding officer of the. Uh, President's Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year. And the New York State meeting was the first event that, you know, as all the meetings, you know, led up to the conference. And so I became involved in the New York State meeting, uh, first of all, organizing the photography exhibits. So uh, I, I set up a, a large photography exhibit of Alice Austin's work. And I also created an exhibit called Women Photographers of New York State, which was curated at the International Center for Photography. Because I always thought it was important to honor other people. <laughs> so, um, so 70 photographers were featured in a slideshow. At that time, we didn't have PowerPoints, so there was an ongoing slideshow. And we created a catalog and so on. And so I photographed extensively at the New York State meeting. Uh, and then uh, for the conference, of course, Bella's aides and associates and her campaigns became you know, very important in the organization of the conference, including, and I have all this documentation because 
you know, it was important for me to document uh, going into it that I should always retain copyright. But if but I have the trail, I have all the correspondence that leads from Leah Novick to uh, from Alice Heyman to Leah Novick. Eventually, the contract came from the State Department, and um, all of my correspondence, my assignment confirmations, my billing was all you know with photographs copyrighted by Nana Noir. So. Um, so yeah, so does that take us to the first National Women's Conference? Is yes, that... yeah. So um, <laughs> I think this would be my well, last question. Well, you asked me, what did I go in wanting to do? Yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to photograph everyone there. This is very simple. You know, I, I really just didn't just want to photograph the celebrities and the president's wives and Coretta Scott King and, you know, I mean, you know, I also wanted to photograph, and and Mim Kelber, who edited the official report, said, "Be sure you take people's names," and I was like, "Oh, I hate doing that, Mim," and I, but I did it, and you know, now I'm really glad I did it, of course. But um, so I wanted to photograph everyone, and. Uh, I realized that people don't understand that there were two official photographers. One covered the torch relay from Seneca Falls to Houston, and she was paid by Coca-Cola. And uh, her name is Pat Fields, and I was in touch with her when we re re when I reprinted the report. And then the other the other one was me. And so Pat really didn't photograph the conference. She photographed everything up to the conference. And then the advantage that I had by being the official photographer and the only one was that I could be there all the time, 24 hours a day. I was in the hotel rooms where the commissioners were meeting. I was in the before the conference, you know, tour of the conference center. And I could be there for every single speech. Whereas the other photographers rotated like uh, photographers do at political conventions where you know there's a table outside the conference you put your name on a list someone's given a, a pass to go in for 20 minutes and they have to bring it back and then the next person on the list if they're there goes in which severely limited you know people other photographers access so whereas i was there <laughs> you know but it was extremely tiring and I, in fact, I stopped smoking during the time when I was doing this assignment because I realized I can't smoke and do this. I mean, I'm not physically capable of doing both. So, um, yeah, so. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I so photographed a lot of the other photographers there. So I saw on your website uh, that you, you you know, and I've always wanted to, I've made an effort to try to find out who those, who those photographers were that I photographed. I also pho photographed photographers at the New York State meeting. Well, but I, I, I gonna... did not take everyone's name, <laughs> even though Mim <laughs> wanted me to, so. Well, I'm gonna make this my last question so we can transition yeah. to others asking you questions. Yeah. And I wanted you to share with us three of your favorite moments um, either during the New York State meeting or the National Women's Conference meeting, like what were um, moments that you were just so blown away to be able to capture through your photography? Um, well, I, I uh, the New York State Women's meeting, um, I guess I was really, I really love the celebrating women event that they had, which is a sort of theatrical event. And um, I photographed, among others, Viney Burroughs. But I didn't, I took her name and wrote it on the back of a print, but didn't really remember that I, I had her name. And so this was a print that I gave to UMass Amherst with, with my collection. And when I decided to put a photograph on the cover, I thought, gee, I hope that's okay with her. And then one day the book had been created for the 35th anniversary of the women's conference that was held in New York City in connection with my exhibit. 
in a speaking event and I, um, I was going through my collection at UMass and I saw this print with her name on the back. And I thought, gee, I better look her up because, you know, a, a book of photographs, if you've taken them in public places, you don't have to get permission. But if they're on the cover, they're advertising. And so I, <laughs> I thought, gee, you know, I wonder if she's alive. And so I looked her up and she was, and I, I called her uh, and she said, well, that's great, you know. <laughs> my picture on the cover of a book. Come on down to New York. I have two tickets for a new play by a woman's playwright. You know, why don't you come with me to the play and then we can talk. So I gave her a copy of the book and I gave her a permission slip, you know, a little late and said, you know, would you grant me permission to use your photograph on the cover of this book? And she said, yeah, but I'd like a few more copies, like 10 more copies of the book. So I said, fine, because <laughs> it did say for valuable consideration. So, uh, so Viney and I stayed close and we met again several times in New York, going to other plays. I think I got tickets to Bella Bella with Harvey Firestein in the title role because they used my photograph of Bella, uh, that first photograph I ever took of her, uh, at the end when he was taking his bows, they projected that photograph of Bella. So they gave me complimentary tickets and I went and Viney came with me and there were you know, other wonderful times when we tried to work you know, for her also to get her, her more honored at the Schoenberg Center. And then for the conference, I think, uh, you know, I guess it has to be this photograph of, you know, what you've seen on the cover of Jane DeHart Matthews, you know, at least the first five editions of her History of Women in America at Oxford University Press. And um, that photograph's exciting to me because the three torchbearers uh, I have since gotten to know, they all three came to the 35th anniversary in New York and spoke in the video. I'll give you the links so that people can see that video and hear them speaking. But, but to, to meet them and to know them has really been an amazing thrill. I just got, you know, and, and so whenever a photograph of, of this, this photograph is published, and if people ask me permission, <laughs> um, I give them a caption with it. And I say, you must include everyone's name in the caption and not like Ellen DuBois did in her book, say, you know, identify everyone, Billie Jean King, Susan B. Anthony, Bella Abzug, three young athletes and Betty Friedan. I mean, it's like, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they have names too. You know, so, you know, so now, you know, I always did that. And I, I just found another uh, photograph uh, of them, not by me, but I thought it was a beautiful photograph. And I sent it to, you know, I'm not in touch with Michelle anymore. I can't find her, but Peggy and I are still uh, in touch and Sylvia and I are still in touch. And, you know, I just, I sent them the photograph. I said, you know, thought you'd like to see this, you know, it's on, another website, but, you know, and Peggy just wrote me today and said, thanks for, for sending it. And then the third photograph I think is um, in connection with that is after when the report was first uh, published, it was brought to the White House to be presented to uh, President Carter and to Tip O'Neill uh, as Speaker of the House. And so I, you know, I was hired to come and photograph that. So the first edition of the Spirit of Houston, the official document doesn't include my photo credits, but the second edition, and it doesn't include the photographs at the White House, but the second edition includes the photographs at the White House. And it also includes, you know, IDs for my photographs. Um, and while I was at the White House, I photographed Gloria Steinem holding uh, the daughter of a delegate 
to the convention, Judy McCarthy, who apparently was having labor pains at the convention, uh, at the conference, but you know, held off having Ira until she got back. And Ira and I are now in touch. And you know, Ira came just to several events and you know, helped me put together this reprint of the Spirit of Houston. And in in the reprint, I have a page which you know shows Judy and Gloria and ERA <laughs> together. Thank you so much. That's yeah. wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording and then I'm going to restart it um, so that I can invite our students and faculty researchers to join in the conversation. So let me um, stop recording.